everybody, and a very warm welcome to the British Library. My name is Marion Wallace, and I'm the Curator for African Studies here at the British Library. So, first of all, I'd like to say that we are truly delighted uh, to be hosting this event with Professor Wale Shoinka tonight. Uh, we're honoured to have you with us. Before handing you over to the people you really want to hear from, I'd like to briefly mention two things about the British Library's collections and activities. The first is that, as you may or may not know, the British Library has extensive collections of African literature. We have Professor Shoinka's works, and we have, beyond that, we have big collections of published books, uh, novels, poetry, drama, literary criticism, in English, in African languages, in French and Portuguese. And we also have large numbers of relevant sound recordings. These collections belong, of course, to you, the public. And you are welcome to come and use them. Just one word about that. If you don't have a reader pass, you'll need to get one first. Just have a look at our website. Secondly, just to let you know that we're currently preparing a major exhibition on West Africa. We'll be focusing on the power of the word in its many manifestations, Arabic manuscripts, symbolic systems, oral literatures, modern creative writing, to name a few. And we'll be telling stories from across West Africa. The exhibition opens in October 2015 and runs until February 2016. We invite you all to put the date in your calendars. Uh, word about mobiles, if you could make sure the sound's turned off, please. And uh, Twitter handles, for those who know about such things, are on the slide. Finally, I'd like to give a big thanks to everyone who made this event possible, particularly our partners, the Royal African Society. I now hand you over to their director, Richard Dowden. Thank you very much, Marion, and, and welcome to the British Library and this wonderful event to celebrate Wurley Sienka's 80th year. My name is Richard Dowden, and as Marion said, I'm director of the Royal African Society. Um, and uh, just briefly what we do, uh, we see ourselves as the big tent for Africa. Uh, we, uh, we have an academic base with African Affairs, our, our academic journal, and our aim is to get a better understanding of Africa in Britain and the world. Uh, we, have fold a, uh, we have a huge meetings program, something like 70 meetings a year, and we work in Parliament as well to make sure all those MPs and ministries are well informed about Africa. We administer the Africa All Party Group. Um, we also work with business, because business is now moving into Africa with the African economies booming, so we try and make sure that they know where they're going and what they're doing and how they should behave when they get there. So we run quite a big program for, for businesses. Uh, and we try and get all this out on our globally on our websites, the Royal African Society website, but also African Arguments, which is a debating website, discussing and analysing the the current issues, and also we list all the events that are happening on Africa in London and uh, br even broader than that on Gateway to Africa. So those are our three websites. We also worked on a, a program engaging the diaspora to make sure that the, the Africans in Britain, their voice is heard on African matters. Uh, and our two big fun events uh, are Film Africa, which we hold in November, uh, about 70 films over 10 days, look out for it, and the book festival, African Rights, which is, uh, this is its opening meeting, though the main event won't happen until uh, July, um, but it is London's biggest uh, festival on, on African writing. Um, and this year, uh, we have the, uh, which, and it'll be held in in uh, in July in the in the on July 11, 13, uh, and uh, it'll be the we'll have the Kane Prize shortlisted writers, Africa in translation, uh, poetry in emotion, um, which uh, is a symposium exploring the works of African poets, including Wangui Wagoro, uh, Vuzi Mchunu, and uh, Gabriel. 
Okunji and many others, and also a session Reclaiming the Feminine Voice, which is a, a poetry evening featuring an all-female group of poets, including uh, the Wosan Shire, Belinda Zawi, Ribka Sibatu, uh, and Chinwe Azubuike. Um, our headline event will be with Ama Ata Aidu, the leading Ghanaian author, poet, playwright, academic, and former Minister of Education, um, who's written many books. So that'll be the big event, which, and it will all be held here. And uh, there'll be a book fair for children here and, uh, and uh, workshops, family activities. So do join up if you're not already a member, and so you can follow all this on our website. Now, to the main event. Uh, my job is simply to introduce the chair tonight, Margaret Busby, who I'm sure most of you, all of you know. Um, I asked her if she minded being called the godmother of African literature in the UK, um, and I got the impression she didn't like that very much, but because <laughs> she's very modest. I would say she was the fairy godmother of it, because I can't, I mean, wherever there is a literary event, Margaret's always uh, at, the, at the heart of it. And she's on the board of all the, uh, all, all the awards um, and uh, started her, her own uh, publishing company, Alison and Busby, back in the 1960s, and it's still going strong. Uh, so thank you for coming, and Margaret, take, take it from there. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our guests of the evening, Professor Wally Shoinka. I was going to say he needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one. I'm going to try and sum up a wonderful life in, in a few words. Professor Wally Shoinka is one of Africa's foremost literary figures with an international stature second to none. He was born in Ake, Abiokuta, Western Nigeria, in 1937. So this evening is part of an ongoing celebration of his 80th birthday, which will be in a couple of months' time, unbelievably. He was educated in Nigeria, including at the University of Ibadan and in the UK, where he gained a degree in English literature at the University of Leeds. He began writing plays in the 1950s. His plays from that decade include uh, The Invention, The Swamp Dwellers, The Lion and the Jewel, and he spent some time working as a script reader at the Royal Court Theatre in London, where his first play was staged in 1957, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong with anything I say. <laughs> uh, probably more right. <laughs> <laughs> Before returning to Nigeria to study African drama and subsequently becoming a university lecturer. Wale Shoenka has played an active role in Nigeria's turbulent political history, spending nearly two years imprisoned in solitary confinement, recounted in his 1971 book, the man died, prison notes. His criticism of Nigerian governments has often exposed him to great personal risk and resulted in periods of voluntary exile abroad. Apart from plays, he has published novels, The Interpreters in 1964, Season of Anomie in 1972, memoirs, notably Ake, The Years of Childhood in 1981. I can't believe I had the audacity to abridge Ake for Radio 4 20 years ago. <laughs> anyway. And most recently, I think, your memoir, You Must Set Forth at Dawn, in 2006. As well as many significant collections of essays, such as Art, Dialogue and Outrage in 1988, and poetry, including Mandela's Earth in 1988 too. And his work has won international acclaim for its deployment of rich poetic language steeped in European mythology and the Yoruba spiritual traditions of West Africa. A playwright, poet, novelist, essayist, memoirist, editor, and much else, filmmaker, songwriter, translator, actor. Rainmaker. Rainmaker. <laughs> <laughs> Wale Shoenke in 1986 became the first African to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Among many other awards and recognition he has been accorded, including several honorary doctorates, in 2005, the Lumina Foundation established the Wallace Joinka Prize for Literature in Africa, which is awarded every other year. Now, that's a brief summary of uh, a wonderful life. 
and I'm going to field a few questions to you, and I know you know there are some that are going to come up, but I'm going to start from the beginning. Ake, your childhood memoir, is, is notably very revered. It's a classic of autobiography. Now, what led you to write that book about your first 11 years, I believe? Um, I never set out uh, deliberately to write Ake. Um, I was on my way to something else. I wanted to capture a certain period, a very special, very rare period, uh, which was disappearing. Um, and this was the, that colonial period, which everybody politically wants to get rid of, but which was very rich in so many ways, a kind of transitional atmosphere. And I felt it was disappearing, and it, I felt a need to capture it. And I wanted to capture it through a biography of my uncle, uh, the Reverend I. O. Ransom Kuti. In other words, Fela Anikulapo's father. <laughs> and then when I came back from uh, studying abroad, I, I met him, we spoke, and he'd agreed that we'd, you know, we'd work together on this. And then he died on me. <laughs> so I just shelved it, so that, that's it. And then uh, one day just came back, just came back to me that whole period and also this sort of mental composition I'd already done, rudimentary writing which I'd done in my head, not one word, you know, on paper. And so I had to write it and that's how I came happened. Mm. I never really set out to do it. <laughs> well, in, in that book you give your parents nicknames, mm -hmm. Wild Christian, your mother, mm -hmm. and Essay, mm -hmm. your father. How did that come about, or well, what, what does that mean to you? In terms well, the of essay it? one was um, was uh, filial enough. It wasn't quite as. Uh, I was surprised when people said, "How could you possibly give your mother a wild Christian?" <laughs> but then they didn't know her. <laughs> <laughs> essay was what my childhood hearing, you know, made out of the initials of my mm -hmm. father, which was S. A. And so when his friends came along, essay, 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 and so he became essay in my mind. Mm -hmm. And he was, he, was a, he was a school teacher and uh, a bit of a, an intellectual, and I, was, I saw him as a kind of embodiment of, a, of an elegant, well-composed, well-written, well-thought-out essay. And so everything just... <laughs> really so it fitted perfectly. It fitted just perfect. Now, my mother. She was wild. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about Christianity, hers was a really, really deep Christianity. She, she believed that everything that she did was the work of God, the instruction of God. She poured water in a glass and a bit spilled over, and she would look and say, my hands are no longer as steady as they were. That's a punishment of God for something. <laughs> and since I wasn't that much of a Christian, and she did her best to convert me. She beat the living shit out of me. <laughs> she, she was wild. She clobbered me and decided that I was going the way of the devil and she was going to bring me back by hook or crook. And so I said, this woman is wild. And so I, I call her wild Christian. <laughs> she was an Anglican. Your father was an Anglican minister as well, was he? She was, sorry. An Anglican. An Angli uh, yes, a Protestant Anglican, that's mm -hmm. right. St. Peter's, that was the name of our church, uh, patron saint. Yes. Okay, well, you've summed up your parents. Now, what characteristics do you think you inherited from each of them? Um, I think that uh, I must have inherited my curiosity about things from somebody. And I have a feeling that that must have come from my father, intellectual curiosity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, curiosity not from my mother. She wasn't curious about anything at all except it pertained to God. To, Christi to, to Jesus Christ. Uh, from my mother, I think I inherited a, a dramatic flair. She was very dramatic <laughs> by her nature. Um, for the rest, uh, an uncanny and rather dangerous patience I also inherited from my father. Uh, if you'd committed some infraction, you pretend he never saw you. Until evening time, wallet, 
go and bring the stick. <laughs> that was her. <laughs> that was him. Uh, it's a mixture of, uh, for the two of them, I think. So you had this Christian upbringing. Yeah. And how did the Yoruba side of your, your value system come in? Yeah, that was part of the problem. My father, thank good, uh, my grandfather, uh, was an out and uh, out, and out uh, uh, Orisha man, pagan, uh, to use the Christian expression, pejorative expression, and I was very proud of him. And eventually, he also fell on the, you know, the missionary uh, zeal, uh, which uh, which made me even more angry against Christianity, because mm -hmm. that side, that traditional side of my upbringing of of my environment was something which I valued enormously. I was drawn to it naturally. Mm -hmm. For me, it was more poetic, it was richer, more colorful, more mysterious. There was nothing left in mystery. Uh, it's been imparted to me through the stick, you know, the attempt at conversion. But that, uh, that side of my spirituality, if you like, came for, through my grandfather. And so that uh, I, uh, really shaped my sensibilities in many, many ways. My sense of myth, mm -hmm. uh, sense of community, et cetera, that came from, from my grandfather's side. And where did your political consciousness come from? When did that emerge? <clears throat> it came from everywhere, but I think largely in terms of a sense of the imperative of activism, not merely of studying a political situation, but being active in, in that situation. Uh, I took that from my uh, great aunt, uh, Mrs. Ransom Kuti. Mm -hmm. uh, she mobilized <clears throat> the women against uh, feudal despotism of the Alaki of Abeokuta. She mobilized the market women. I liked her sense of organization, uh, you know, her, her teaching. She was also a great political teacher. And I also inherited some of that from my uncle, uh, Razum Kuti. They were both anti-colonial uh, forces. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they saw, while they collaborated, they, they were quite at ease with the colonial officers, British officers, mm -hmm. but politically, they were very much aware of their being interlopers and impeding, uh, in some ways, the development of African society in their own way. So then you decided to become a playwright? At, at what point? When did that happen? I don't know that I decided. Uh, I just started writing started plays. Writing. I began with short stories. Short stories. But uh, simultaneously, I think as a child, I was also form, uh, fond of, um, of putting together my siblings to enact short stories. So it, start, it all started very early. Yeah. What sort of age was that? Um, <clears throat> as far as I can remember, it was as early as you like. Um, maybe as soon as I could uh, listen to short stories and understand the short story, there was always a tendency to want to enact them in one way or the other. And can you remember what the first play you wrote would have been? I believe it was a radio play. Uh, BBC was coming into uh, West Africa, Nigeria, and. Uh, um, there were all kinds of funny sounds coming from that, uh, which signified human beings doing unusual things. Mm -hmm. I used to listen to those plays, and eventually, I think I sent a play to the NBC, the local NBC radio, and I believe that was the first radio play in Nigeria at the time. That would have been in the mid-50s? Uh, yes, I think that was mid-50s, correct. Mm -hmm. yes. I was still in school, um, and um, it was marvellous just to hear my play on the radio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you came to Britain to study, you began writing plays that were being staged. How? Sorry. No, yes. no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, was, I was going to ask, how did you feel when you actually saw your plays being enacted on the stage of, say, the Royal Court Theatre? Mm, very dissatisfied. It, <laughs> it didn't turn out to be quite what I expected. Mm. All kinds of uh, 
you know, uh, strange things happen in that production at the Royal Court Theatre. Mm -hmm. uh, John Devine, uh, by this time, had sent plays Sam Wanamaker to the Royal Court Theatre. And uh, while waiting for the opportunity to stage this play, John Devine had this marvelous progressive idea of bringing together young playwrights. Uh, this was the time when John Osborne was breaking through the mold of British theatre. And John Devine at the Royal Court Theatre wanted people like Arnold Wesker, around him, Angelico, and um, then instituted the Sunday Night Theatre, which is part reading, part performance. And uh, after being playwright, some, you know, a big play reader, uh, he would then try out their plays, you know, in sort of rough and ready form at the upstairs mm -hmm. theatre. And uh, it was the invention, I think, which was first staged there, and all kinds of disasters. What sort uh, of disasters? You know, <laughs> the climax, the bomb didn't go off in time. Oh. You know, uh, technical hitches. Like, so, you know, <laughs> technical hitches. So I said, no, it's not what the play should be like. <laughs> but anyway, it was a very good exercise for me. But so when Nigeria became independent, you had a play that was performed at the celebration there, um, the, dance, the Dance of the Forest. Mm. How did that come about? Well, there was a competition, I remember, organized by Encounter magazine. Uh, I think this was done for every country that was just becoming independent. And I sent in the play to the judges and it was accepted uh, for the Nigerian uh, independence play. But when it came to the sponsoring of the play by the government, and this was, these were the conditions that whichever play was uh, selected from whichever country, the government would present it, you know, back it all the way. Somebody then pointed out, uh, or pointed out is wrong to say pointed out, because that means it was there, what was pointed out. Let's just say that somebody then told them that this play was subversive. <laughs> that this was a dance of the forest, you know, independence was supposed to be uh, joyful, joyous, and celebrative, and uh, you know, it was supposed to be a party. Mm -hmm. And then he said, oh, there's a subversive message in that. Uh, the gathering of the tribes is critical of the, of, uh, the, the post-independence generation. It went into history, but the history was supposed to be a kind of paralleling of the, uh, of the dangers which we mostly unconsciously were entering into, given the nature of the first generation nationalists, what I already saw and embedded in the play. You know, all these very clever, clever civil servants, mm -hmm. you know, in the cultural department. And so the government said, no, we're not, uh, we're not, we're not going to touch it. But the, uh, the prize money mm -hmm. was reasonable for the time. And so I used it to stage the play anyway. <laughs> As you mentioned the word subversion, that seems to be a theme through most of your life. Yeah, um, yeah people, many people don't understand the words. You know, you tell the truth and they say you're being subversive. <laughs> what, can you, what can you do about that? <laughs> You've been very critical of, of many of the governments of Nigeria. Um, how did you find yourself in a position to... Well, you, you kept putting yourself in personal danger because you spoke out. Was that something that you thought about consciously or you just... No, it... Um, when... Remember, this was a period of very heady um, and turbid also struggle for independence. And at that stage, we weren't re really looking... I'm talking about people of my generation, those who mm -hmm. were politically conscious, aware, of what was going on in the world. We were not even thinking in terms of our own nations, mostly. Africa was focused on um, South Africa, mm -hmm. on Kenya, on what you might call settler colonialism, as opposed to um, um, uh, sort of surrogate colonialism, which the British operated through um, Obas, chiefs, and so on. 
So you didn't really feel <clears throat> you were being robbed in a very visceral way, as in the case of the Rhodesias, <laughs> South Africa, where, where the racism became for us a, a personal rebuke, you know, a race, uh, an act of racial disdain. And we felt that our mission, our destiny in life was to go down and liberate Southern Africa. So the mental preparation and other forms of you know, self-preparation was in the direction of Southern Africa, which we were awaiting eagerly the day the whole of Africa would go down and liberate Southern Africa. And then we began to encounter the first generation leaders of our nation. And we saw that they were more concerned with liberating, uh, with uh, occupying the shoes of the departing, the chairs of the departing colonial powers. That they would come to England ostensibly to hold meetings, serious meetings. And we saw that they were more interested in just having a very good time. So we turned our gaze inwards and said, listen, we better liberate the home front before we go down <laughs> to South Africa. That's how I became involved in uh, internal politics of Nigeria. You, you, you say we, but quite often you're acting in a very individual way. Well, <clears throat> I, um, let's say I felt things a bit more deeply than some <laughs> of my colleagues, uh, far more deeply. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of the time um, when you famously was it held up a radio station? <laughs> Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I was put on trial and I was acquitted. <laughs> I, just, I, I just want to hear your version. <laughs> I want to hear your version. <laughs> Well, actually, I give the game away a little in You Must Set Forth at Dawn. I felt a sufficient number of years had passed for me to give a hint of what may have happened at the time. You're something of an action man, actually, in a lot of ways. I mean, there, there are other occasions where you, you got yourself into scrapes. Um, what would you say... Would, do you see your writing as inextricably linked with your political... Activity? Uh, I would say so, um, uh, because most of my writing has uh, political coloration. Mm. But then I don't set out deliberately always to write political plays. And there are plays of mine which are not political, mm -hmm. which are mythological, <coughs> historical, in which I actually try to replicate what happened historically, you know, sticking as much to the facts as possible taking only dramaturgical licenses, not political, uh, you know, not, not being moved, motivated by making a political statement or anything of the sort. Uh, I believe that there's so much tumult in life that, and also at the same time, uh, there's quite a lot of beauty in life that one also wants to transmit in one's own words. You t you've written in many different forms. Is there one particular form that you feel closest to? I, mean, I expect you to say plays, but I mean, you've written poetry, as I've said, you've written essays, you've written novels, other fiction. Which is the, the uh, genre that you feel closest to? You're right. I, 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 I like, uh, I like not just writing the plays, envisaging it as it would be on the, on the stage, on the boards. What about your acting ambitions? Oh, I never had any. Um, if you saw me on stage acting at any time, circumstances caused. Either somebody has dropped out at the last moment, I'm directing a play, perhaps somebody's dropped out, or more likely I've thrown somebody out. <laughs> yeah, I, and then I have, and I can't find a replacement in time, so I have a moral <laughs> obligation <laughs> to step on stage or before the camera. That's, uh, but acting, no. Um, not too fond of acting. Mm. Can you tell me something about the Mbari Writers Group that you were involved in and how, how that right. came out, what, the, what its aims were? Mm. Um, I came back and I was anxious. I mean, I'd interacted with, uh, with the theatre here. Uh, I'd seen Cafe Theatre. Mm -hmm. Remember, it was during that period where 
what is that? That, uh, that group called themselves, I don't think John Osborne was one of them. It was during that period you saw the birth of the equivalent, if you like, of street theater, mm -hmm. cafe theater. Somewhere in Soho there was this, uh, this cafe theater, which eventually led to this magazine, Irreverent Magazine, mm -hmm. uh, whose first name I cannot remember. Anyway, I saw both at the Royal Court Theatre and uh, in that cafe theatre setting. I, I saw uh, the marvelous project coming out through the interaction of artists, musicians, uh, designers, uh, playwrights, uh, and so on and so forth. So when I went back, I, before I even got back, I'd envisaged uh, the creation of something similar. And I began looking for premises. In fact, the name that I gave it at the time was something, The Tall Mind. The Tall Mind, it's just a whimsical name. Then came this uh, Austrian uh, wanderer called Uli Bayer and his wife, an artist called Susan Wenger, who came to Nigeria and were smitten completely by Yoruba culture. And Uli uh, this, uh, wanted to start something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Uli traveled out, came back, and said that he'd found a foundation who could assist in this, and that if I could get some artists, uh, writers, you know, creative people together, uh, that he felt he could get us the money. I said, don't you worry about that. It's there, it's already. it's just awaiting money. And the ability just to pay rent and pay token fees to some artists. And that's how the Mbari uh, came about, gathered the artists, uh, Mabel Shegun, Chino Achebe, J.P. Clark, and uh, Debas Nwoko, the artist, the designer. And uh, it began to hold workshops, and we had um, a bar, and there was a Lebanese uh, restaurant, just a very important part. <laughs> uh, and so it became a community of artists, experimenting, mm -hmm. branching off in different ways. And eventually, uh, Dula Dipo, I think, uh, came from Oshobo, saw what was happening. In fact, he was invited to take part in a dramatic repertory and brought his, this marvelous music tragedy of his Oba Kusu, which later toured uh, the world. And he went back to Shobu and uh, set up a similar um, uh, club, which he called Mbari Mbayo, after he made a pun on Mbari, and that was the first branch of uh, Mbari outside Ibadan. How long did that last, the Mbari venture? It lasted virtually till the Civil War, you know, and struggled on fitfully, tried to keep on its feet after that, but it was never the same again after the Civil War. You mentioned the Civil War. How did that impact on your life personally? It impacted, first of all, in the sense of a loss of an artistic community, basically. We all scattered in different directions. The Biafrans went their own way. Uh, some left for you know other countries. Uh, my friends, colleagues were on the other side. Um, it was one of the motivations for my you know, trying to do everything to stop the shooting actually beginning because I knew where it would eventually end if it ever ended. Uh, I think that was the main thing: this the that sense of loss of community and the shrinking, shall we say, of the creative spirit in terms of collaboration that was the main thing. I know you, you've probably spoken a lot about what's actually happening now in Nigeria with the abduction of the girls and Boko Haram. Would you like to talk a bit about that and say what your view is of how the situation has been dealt with, what, what needs to be done, what the government is doing wrong? Well, the first thing I would like to emphasize to people, especially outsiders, is that they shouldn't be taken in by any notion that Boko Haram began just a few years ago. Boko Haramism, if you like, began many, many years ago when politicians began to use uh, religion as a means of attaining power, uh, began to corrupt the minds of youth after having neglected them, then uh, indoctrinated them in extreme uh, religion, religion, religious adhesion. 
um, began to build around themselves, uh, should we say, armies of the Almajiri. The Almajiri, uh, that's the name for youth in the Islamic uh, religion, who sit at the feet of mullahs and virtually imbibe knowledge by rote. You have a tunnel, a vision, the entire existence is focused on uh, attaining benefices in the afterworld. Uh, uh, the afterworld. They go out to beg, uh, part and parcel of their religious, you know, training. They believe uh, they depend entirely on the uh, on the benevolence of their teachers, you know, and uh, they do not. They don't allow their brought up in a way in which they have no alternative view of life. As politics became hotter and hotter, the politicians took over these, um, uh, this, uh, uh, shall we say, homeless uh, uh, armies and began to twist their minds even further. They virtually told them, your enemies are non-Muslims, and they are to be uh, treated as spiritual enemies, in fact. Religion became uh, mixed with politics in their minds, creating a toxic brew that poisoned their personalities completely. Now, whereas before in my childhood, we lived harmoniously with other religions as a as you know, I was raised in a Christian home. And the Christians would celebrate the various Muslim festivals, Eid, Ramadan, the whole lot. Some Christians would even fast during the period of the Muslim fast, a gesture of spiritual solidarity, and vice versa, others in Easter. If uh, that is Muslims, you know, fast in Easter. If they didn't receive, uh, let's say, a piece of turkey or pudding, you know, it was sent to the house. What, what, what's wrong? Similarly, the Christians, if they didn't receive their hunch of, uh, of uh, the slaughtered ram, would say, ah, wait a minute, we cook the rice, where's the meat? <laughs> yeah, this, th this is the way we related. And then one saw this just degenerate, a separation which grew wider and wider and wider a gulf of hostility in which people would tell their children, don't go and uh, play over there. Although there was always a little bit of that. They are non-Christians, don't go and play with them. The others would say, watch these Christians and so on. But it was on that very trivial level in which even people with that notion, we rebuke, there'd be other Muslims who rebuke uh, the, the extreme uh, Muslims. There'd be uh, also uh, correctives from the Christian side. It was not hostile. It certainly did not result in, you know, homicidal mm. tendencies. And then gradually we watched this degenerate until uh, you'd find attacks, let us say, on Christians so during their Corpus Christi marching down the streets and so on. Then as the political divide stiffened <coughs> and militant is, you know, Islam began to overtake the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you can date that from any time you want, but I know that the, uh, the development of real uh, violent um, religionism was not uh, detached completely from what was happening in other parts of the world. So the period of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, who felt that he had the power of life and death over anybody, especially writers. That kind of thing becomes infectious comes infectious, people became surrogate ayatollahs in their little religious ponds. And then, with the evolution of Al-Qaeda, training outside became commonplace. And the culture of impunity became rampant. In other words, uh, you could be you could have your head cut off, your throat cut, simply because you are suspected mm -hmm. to have insulted Islam one way or the other. We had numerous cases like that. Uh, in even Muslim um, 
exteriors, you have these sabongari for pagans like myself. You know, in Sabangari, you can do what you want. It's recognized as a place of strangers. And strangers are welcome, even in solidly Muslim areas. Mm -hmm. Then the division got wider and wider. Uh, is there the, a reason that the division got wider? The division between Christians and... Is there a reason uh, uh, for that? I'm, I'm, I'm politics, saying, mostly, mm -hmm. and also mimicry. You know, everybody likes to mimic power wherever it's been exercised elsewhere. It becomes a question of, wait a minute, why are they killing people over there? And we are not killing people here. I mean, it's as crude, I'm afraid. It's as crude as that. That sense of, you must dominate the other mm -hmm. side. You must show that your religion, you know, has authority over every other kind of religion. And that if you did not, and then the interpretation of scriptures mm -hmm. to conform with your lust for power over others, very selective, you know, you must do this, you must do that, you must treat the other, the other side like eternal enemies. Instead of leaving the other side to be dealt with by your God, when you all get to the other side, you wanted to administer that punishment. It's a very crude form of power mentality. Unfortunately, power and sense of craving for domination rules much of human relations. You know, I don't know how that started. Maybe anthropologists can tell us, but I find that that sense of power is inculcated in most human beings. All right. Mm. So then, impunity, people could riot, cut throats, destroy, even invade the capital. Destroy, kill, and go away. Not one single prosecution. Not one single. A school teacher who's invigilating a class in religious knowledge, that is religion of I mean, study of all religions, can be and was, and not just once, set upon by her pupils. You know, this particular instance, very gruesome, and she just said, you're cheating. Looking into your scriptures, bring that over here, and she puts it aside. And they run home and say, she's insulted the Quran. In the meantime, the others started beating her, stripping her, put a tie over uh, her neck. She runs into the principal's house for, uh, for uh, protection, pushes her out. This woman is dismembered openly. We do not hear of any punishment being admitted. I don't know how many cases I could cite. I just don't know how many. So it, society became deteriorated into, uh, into one of arbitrary death arbitrary lynching on religious grounds, real or imagined offenses. But the government refused to take, you know, to take mm -hmm. action to show that only one law applies to the entire uh, nation. Now, this is where Boko Harabism began. It didn't begin when a governor in a secular state declared his state a theocratic state in the midst of a multiple uh, religious, religious society. Yes, these were defining moments, but Boko Haramism, that culture of impunity on religious grounds, where, for instance, a legislator, a legislator, uh, in fact, he began with as a governor, could indulge in transborder pedophilia be a member of a lawmaking assembly later after he left office in, uh, uh, as a governor, declare a fatwa, you know, a call to murder, a killing fatwa without consequences, then himself be guilty of importing underage girls from another country, a Muslim country, Egypt, I have the nerve to say, I can do what I want because my religion permits it. The point is the Constitution and the law do not permit it. And he gets away with it, and you have numerous cases like that. So the mentality of a certain section of the country was guided towards a kind of um, supremacy mm -hmm. over the rest. And so when the politicians, the politicians built on this, used this brainwashed Algeria, and of course, this became connected with international 
fundamentalism, militant and killing fundamentalism, these al majiri were being sent to Somalia to be trained by al-Shabaab. Al some of them went to Afghanistan for trading. Some went to Mauritania. The country became divided. And this is when they grew bold enough that this is extremists to actually call themselves an act to dismiss any other uh, structure of knowledge, structure of human relationships, community, etc., which did not conform to theirs. But we now have a situation which is, uh, which is a critical change because those who were trained to commit mayhem eventually turned against their mentors. As you had one Sharia state after another, and you had nine Sharia states altogether with this unwashed army which was prepared to do anything at the bidding of their masters. As they went for training, they became more and more radicalized. And then they came home and were telling their mentors, you are not Sharia enough. You deserve to die. This when the killing, what people, what people call indiscriminate killing began. But it was not indiscriminate. It's that they now saw even their mentors mm. as sinners worse than the non-fundamentalists. That is the situation we're in today. Law had broken down. Law was disdained. If a legislator can say, I'm not bound by your laws. I can kill. I can rape. I can do what? And he's sitting and earning a salary in the mm. very house making the laws, which he then says, do not apply to me. Of course, his followers take their example from him and then say, we'll go even further and get to the point where it's not just you're going to schools and you're cutting the throats of teachers, you're cutting the throats of parents who dare send their children to school. You now say, ah, wait a minute, what about those schools? Don't let's just kill them, let's abduct them and go and sell them as slaves. That is what is happening mm -hmm. today. Boko Haramism did not begin 10 years ago, goes back 15. Many people are not, not even aware of the fact when it began on a small scale and police stations were taken over and they were named Afghanistan and they were named Iraq and so on. The army moved in, managed to destroy, and destroy them. It began all the way back. We're reaping the, the seeds of wrath which have been laid by the, by the mentors, the seekers after power. You've been speaking out for half a century about the political ills and wrongs as you're doing now. Do you see any successes? What are the successes you see in the campaigns you've been involved with over those decades? Well, I don't know that one can even talk about uh, success. The important thing is to curb Mm. to curb it, to make it, uh, to make the phenomenon manageable, manageable, not to, we should never have allowed it to reach the level it has now. It's a level of defiance, of contempt for the rest of society. You saw that, uh, that uh, Mr. the latest uh, leader of uh, Boko Haram boasting about abducting uh, children, saying we're going to sell them as wives and concubines. Uh, we should never have arrived at this point. We had a head of state, for instance, when the first governor declared his state a theocratic state. That was an opportunity missed. In fact, I hold such people responsible for failing to say to them, listen, this is a, people, some people don't like to hear secular state. So let's say multi-religious state. But that one thing binds everybody and that's the Constitution. Those are the protocols by which we've all agreed to live together. And either you accept that or you treat it as a pariah of state. Instead, that particular head of state was so busy, determined, very determined, desperate to earn a third unconstitutional third term in office. So he began to woo those Sharia states, the governors over there, so that they can back a change in constitution. That is the reality which many people are running away from. That neglect, deliberate neglect 
encouragement of impunity for small, selfish political ends. It is what made this Boko Haram, you know, balloon, this menace balloon to a, to a condition that we're now asking for international help. Oh, I hope we are, because um, mm -hmm. we cannot handle it alone anymore. Is this something you're going to be writing about? Writing about? Uh, at this point, you know, <laughs> when things reach a certain point, a certain stage where your daughters are being abducted, yeah. you just have to concentrate on a means of getting them back. And seeing that those who dared to inflict this uh, anomaly on the state are caught and punished, then simultaneously, however, you should start planning for the future, the rehabilitation, not merely of the, of the brainwashed, you know, hundreds and thousands working out educational systems which will ensure that they never again get their minds uh, poisoned. Uh, you should start planning what you do for these girls after they've been, uh, uh, been rescued because they're going through a trauma at the moment which is unimaginable and which we know will affect them for the rest of their lives. So those are the priorities right now. Later on we might get around to writing about it. I'm not sure whether it's time yet for questions. Um, yes? Okay, we're going to have, we're going to open up the floor and there's a microphone that's going to be going around. Um, so, if you raise your hands if you have a particular question for Pro Professor Kroenka and perhaps say who you are. Hello, um, good evening. Um, my name is Michael Irene. Um, I'm studying the um, PhD in creative writing. I just wanted to ask you um, a question about um, myth in contemporary African writing. Do you think oral tradition um, is being used by contemporary African authors enough to retain um, oral tradi African tradition? Uh, there's no question at all in my mind uh, uh, of the natural cohabitation of um, oral uh, literature and literature, written literature. First of all, in many cases, the oral gets transcribed. And at that point, what does it become? <laughs> then uh, technology, radio, video, etc., has ensured that this uh, line of uh, creativity is preserved and preserved in the closest uh, form that you can have next to performance of oral literature, whether the epics or uh, Ijala, for instance, in Yoruba, the poetry, which is used in a contemporary way. During political upheaval, as you know very well, the oral tradition comes into play uh, from the traditional artists, very effectively, perhaps even more so than the written form. Um, good evening, my name is Sakina, and I'm a master's student at the LSE. Um, thank you so much for providing a very rich historical context um, of Boko Haram. Um, and um, my question is, what do you think people who are young like me um, and in the, in the diaspora, what do you think we can do? I mean, how do we get our voices heard? Um, how angry really should we be about this? And really, how, how can we make a change um, in, our, in our countries? Well, <clears throat> if you listen to uh, the criticism, criticisms, for instance, of the president of Nigeria in terms of acting very late, and very... Uh, not sufficiently, with sufficient resolve, they can achieve uh, results. Uh, I think that the diaspora can assist in the sort of demonstrations we've been seeing all over the world in making Nigerians themselves understand that this is not just a Nigerian problem, that this is a, that a crime against humanity 
has been committed, and it becomes the total responsibility of the entire uh, global community, but with special emphasis on Africans in the diaspora. Whimsically, um, but not entirely whimsically, I believe we're moving to a situation where, you see, there's a, kind, there's a culture of aggression, confidence, arrogant, arrogant aggression going on. And I think maybe it's about time we began thinking of creating forces which will assist, which will go to the rescue of societies which find themselves in this kind of condition. Uh, you hear of uh, uh, black widows, maybe it's time we have some brown widows <laughs> who actually take it on themselves to match the culture of self-defense by whatever means, by whatever means. Because this, uh, this attitude of sometimes supineness, not actually uh, supineness, but just the inability to respond in kind or proactively to what we are witnessing today. I think we might get to a stage where uh, freedom squads, freedom teams take on their own defense and are assisted you know, in the kind of expertise needed to respond to what we're undergoing today on the African continent. So it's both a kind of, um, it's political response that is necessary, a sense of global solidarity, you know, which takes forms, as I said, like uh, demonstration, etc. cetera. Um, the readiness to, to uh, embark aggressively on a counter-indoctrination approach. And finally, we may even reach the point where we actually train people to respond to those who feel that they have a divine right to mess up our lives. Um, Mutala Ture is my name. Um, my first point, I, um, I think one of the anomalies um, in, uh, uh, in Nigeria, I'm a Gambian by the way, it's uh, the constitution that makes distinction between indigenous and citizens. A Nigerian citizen can be uh, a foreigner, so, so to speak, if he's not an indigenous of a particular state. You know, and I think that's kind of sowed the seed for uh, this unity, uh, this et ethnic, uh, uh, I mean, tension in, uh, in Nigeria. And uh, the second question is, how does a Wole Shoinka day look like? Do you have a set routine? I mean, for... You say that I'm so... <laughs> yeah, for an 80-year-old man, I think you look very good. <laughs> I, I just missed one critical word, I think. Was it, that how does Wale uh, Sheikh... Hmm? Your day. Your routine. Your routine. Your daily routine. Routine? Your routine. Routine. Routine, like, I mean, uh, yeah, like I mean, in the morning, what you do up to night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got mixed up, because I thought you we were talking about indigents and citizens. The next... <laughs> The next moment is what you see. First of all, <clears throat> I think we need a constitution which, if you really want to be one nation, then without losing your culture, without losing, I'm talking about indigenous now, without losing their culture, without uh, trying to create a kind of uh, synthetic national culture, but identifying yourself, being proud of what you are as an indigenous. Um, you should also have, as an indigen of a natural, um, a national space, or <clears throat> as a crossover, you know, you want to nationalize, become a citizen, obviously. Culturally, yes, one can lay emphasis on indigen, but as a citizen, I think uh, cultural, 
culture becomes um, a little bit problematic to insert in a constitution. So once you are uh, born in a place or you migrate, you want to settle there, you become uh, a citizen. And once you've uh, nationalized and you should be treated as such, there's also the problem of multiple uh, citizenship, internal, internal, in which, for instance, you find some states who say, you are foreigners in this state, therefore you cannot hold a job. You cannot enjoy the scholarship in a state, even if your parents have been living there, have worked there, contributed, paid tax, and so on. For me, this is pernicious. Anyone who has settled somewhere who has, who's paying tax in that piece of uh, real estate is entitled to the full citizen right of the totality. That's what I thought you were actually uh, uh, on the track uh, uh, towards. Now, routine. <laughs> I have none. I have none because it's constantly been disrupted. <laughs> My best laid plans always go awry sooner or later. Something crops up, as everybody knows, and the next, instead of flying southwards, I'm flying northwards. So I've given up. <laughs> no. I'm at the mercy of everybody here, <laughs> because I was expected somewhere else, and here I am sitting here. You're all guilty. <laughs> Good evening, sir. My name's Takumba Kweiki. Um, this is such a honor and pleasure to be in your presence tonight. I just wanted to ask you, um, reading your autobiography, Ake, it's so richly vivid, and there's a particular scene that actually stayed in my head um, when you were describing your auntie when she visited you and her love for Moi Moi, Moi Moi Lewe, and how you described the fact that she actually loved to eat the pads are wrapped in the leaves. They actually made me go back to think about how I eat my moi moi. And like the next time I was eating one, I actually tried to imagine that thing. And to me, I just wanted to know when you were writing it, were you back at home? And I mean, because obviously you were writing about your very early formative years. And I can barely remember my teenage years, let alone the first 11 years of my life. So it's just just really struck me, you know, the descriptions that you have in your book, and I just wanted to kind of get your thought process behind that. Thank you. Well, that's where the writing about K becomes very interesting, because when I, when my uncle died, and I said, okay, I'll wait until, you know, I refocus my mind and imagination and recollection, uh, that took a while. And actually, I wrote the first, because I wanted to write it now, since I wasn't writing about adult life, the politics of the period in an analytical way, I, I felt that the only approach I can have is to, is to try and re-enter with vivid internal uh, recollection from the point of view of a child, what that period really meant to me. And when I began, uh, I, I was able to write the first three chapters, and then I lost it. Uh, it just disappeared. The mood which I felt I had, I was re-seeing, re-viewing uh, things with the eyes uh, which I had at the time, and it just disappeared. And I didn't go back to it for about, um, for about three years. Yeah, about well, three years, I couldn't go back to it. And then one day, something, an image, a passage, a piece of music, I can't remember what now, but something just triggered off that period and I re-entered it and virtually wrote the whole thing all over again. And the interesting thing was that I decided to start all over again. And when I, by accident or the other, when I compared the first three chapters I'd written, with the new ones I'd written, it was almost word for word. <laughs> I thought, as a writer, obviously an interested writer, well, the other, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's quite a miracle of recollection. It was almost word for word. Is so. it true that you have a photographic memory? Mm? Yes, I do have that as well. I do have that photographic memory. Actually, I, I was astonished 
about two thirds way through my life, I was discovered. I, I was astonished to discover that not all people have photographic memories. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I thought it was everybody was like me, but I do have a photographic. Memory. That's why I hate cameras. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mavani Wanyaki. I am a Kenyan. Um, and I work mainly in human rights. Um, I'm just curious, you talked about what it felt like belonging to an artistic community at a given point in time before the Civil War. And you, we all know about your engagement with sort of the political... I'm missing <coughs> a lot of that. Could you put the camera? Uh, I have also some hearing problems. Am I talking too quietly? Or Okay. You talked about what it felt like belonging to an artistic community, especially before the Civil War. And I guess we all know you've been involved in a political community since. Um, I'm just wondering if you could share your reflections on the relationship and overlaps or distances between those two things, an artistic as opposed to an activist or political community. That's one. Um, and then second, thinking of sort of the new wave of African writing that's come up and all the young fabulous voices, uh, not just from Nigeria, but across the continent. If you follow that work and their trajectory, what are your reflections, given your generation, on what you think the themes they're engaging with and their own engagement with their own societies and state at this point in time? The relationship between the artistic community and? And the more political activist mm -hmm. community. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on that for your generation and then your reflections on that looking at the next generation or the current generation of young African writers? Well, the artistic community in any society is never static. You know, it's very fluid, always uh, uh, changing, in, not drastically, but uh, you're bound together in any case by one common cause and that's creativity. Uh, an artistic community which is uh, which is uh, which never fights within itself will be a very boring artistic community. I think we spark off one another, and the sparks sometimes become embers if one is not careful. Uh, but it's always manageable because there is a common goal. Now, politically, for instance, you can never have everybody with the same ideology in society. There are those who uh, whom you might call artists of the establishment, but at the same time, they are creative uh, geniuses, you know, one level or the other. And I think almost not, the main thing is not to try and create and, 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 and establish a, a sort of a unicellular thinking uh, artistic community, as variety, as much variety as possible, what keeps it alive. And so it's not surprising that when you have to confront the political community, where you feel very committed towards confronting the uh, political community, uh, you find others who defend what you are trying to destroy. Or who are just comfortable with it, who feel why rock the boat our mission, is to be creative, to write poetry, and so on. And of course, they write. And there's no reason why the two cannot co cohabit. It's when <coughs> members of an artistic community range themselves uh, against what you consider progressive uh, to the extent that they become activists on behalf of the enemy. That's when the problem begins. Disputations, for me, this is a normal. Disagreements, even over the means to, uh, to obtaining change, to transforming society, all this, for me, are quite normal. But sometimes, from time to time, you find those who actively take the side of the establishment, the political establishment, re the reactionary establishment. Then there is trouble. The community disintegrates very quickly, and there's no point in trying to keep it up. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my name is Chibundu. Thank you for your work, sir. Your talk, sir. I'm going to ask you about your Afro. I, <laughs> I don't know if you are aware, but there's a band called Shoinka's Fro. And just in general, your, <laughs> your person in itself is iconic. Every roadside painter in Lagos has a portrait of your face to advertise their skill. And I wonder how you interact with this iconography of your person. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's a nuisance sometimes, <laughs> you know, quite frankly. It's a nuisance. Because um, you like your anonymity as much as possible. You know that some is already lost because you're what you might call a public figure. But to carry literally this burden on your head <laughs> yeah, uh, <clears throat> it's a level of masochism which I didn't think I was capable of. And of course, it's also a danger. Because during the season of Sonny Abacha, for instance, I couldn't comfortably, never could relax outside in a public place, uh, sitting in cafes and so on and so forth. I, was, I had, I think, a total of, uh, um, I think I had more hats than the average woman. Yeah? <laughs> and they're the ones I usually see carrying boxes, pill boxes with their hats. You know, each hat constitutes a luggage by itself, you know. And I didn't think that men had so many hats. But I had lots of head covers, including the Rasta. <laughs> you try and picture me in a Rasta during that period. And then I could relax outside. Um, I, I think I should hold a patent to it. You know, it, might, it might earn me more money than uh, royalties from books. You know, I think about that. <laughs> this one at the back there. Thank you for uh, your presence, sir. It's an honor to be um, speaking with you and everyone. Um, I want to say that um, you provided a very rich, um, deep in insight of what is happening back in Nigeria. Um, as someone that spent 20 years of my life growing in that part of the country, I mean, I identify with everything you had you, you said. Uh, my question is, um, do you have anything planned, um, you know, to make sure the Nigerian government um, sees this initiative and uh, now that the eyes of the world is on Nigeria? And, um, I mean, plan like how you went with J.P. Clark and Chino Achibe to Dodan Barracks um, on behalf of Mama Vatsa, um, back then, and also a uh, second question is um, what um, key advice will you give to someone who is a writer and is writing um, on um, basically historical fiction? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me take the second one first. <laughs> Write. <laughs> Prepare to collect your rejection slips, <laughs> lock them up in a Draw and continue to write and send out your manuscripts. Test them out on the literary pages of newspapers, in literary magazines, and so on. Don't wait until you created the master, the definitive work before you try to see them, uh, see your works in one form or the other uh, in the public uh, domain. Then. Also, uh, don't feel, and now I'm talking personally about the way I work, don't feel frustrated or constrained by the fact that, uh, if that is the case, that you cannot sit from uh, 8 a.m. in the morning to 2 p.m. in the afternoon or 8 uh, p.m. at night, feeling that unless you work in a continuous and broken uh, fashion, you will never be a writer. Sorry, you have to snatch whatever moments you have very often and uh, just put things together. Write when inspiration comes. Write when you feel uh, compelled to finish what you have begun. But don't, uh, don't force it at the same time. Don't force it. 
Those are the only advices I can give you. Now, the other one, you were thinking of the time when uh, Chinua, a period when we could attempt collectively to influence uh, the decisions or the policies of government. Um, yes, those times are possible. Uh, I would have loved to see writers, for instance, the young writers, because the baton has been passed on to them. I would like to see them coming together to attempt to influence a situation like this. We, our commitment was not, uh, was not a structured thing. We responded to critical moments such as the life of uh, people like Vatsa at the hands of uh, the military at the time. I, I would like to see the young uh, generation of writers taking the initiative and saying, no, we cannot stomach this anymore. And we're going to come out uh, using whatever legitimate means uh, we can to try and influence policy. I think by now we should stop looking in this direction uh, for, um, for leadership. I think by now we should produce your own leaders. Um, hello, sir. My name is Ade Awokoya, and I'm an aspiring writer. My simple question is, what gave you the inspiration to translate Fagunwa's uh, Forest of a Thousand Demons into English? Um, inspiration? Uh, I've always loved the, first of all, the use of language of, um, of Fagunwa, Dio Fagunwa, the Yoruba novelist. He's asking about those who don't know. Uh, and also the, the wildness of his imagination. So from school, I'd always said, one of these days, I would translate Fagnoir. And when I came back from studying abroad, and in addition, side by side with writing my own, I began to, uh, to translate, maybe to fulfill this, uh, ambition is the wrong word, just this desire, this passionate desire to, to make the works more accessible to other people. By the time I finished the first uh, novel, uh, Forest of a Thousand Demons, I realized that was the end of my mission. <laughs> because that man's Yoruba is just so tough. <laughs> Finding equivalents in English for his Yoruba, uh, it just took too much out of me. I said, I will never write my own work if I continue <laughs> translating this man. So I put that particular uh, plan of action aside. But since then, thank goodness, I've been able to find time to translate two more, I think. Yes, I believe so, yeah. I think I didn't need to translate it others. But I was just wanting to get that work out. That's the, that's the main thing. Do you, can I ask you, do you have plans for what you're going to do next? What your, your next book is going to be? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm engaged in some uh, work at the moment. Not entirely, not fiction. Uh, but I never talk about what I'm working on. Okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> There's a couple of questions at the back. Um, okay. Um, my name is Lukman Sanusi from Bubbles FM. Um, I'd like to take us back to the political scenario in Nigeria. As you've mentioned earlier on, that there are various levels of impunity in Nigeria, including self-denial. Um, the case of the first lady comes to mind. She doesn't even believe that these girls um, have been abducted. And then she called a meeting and even have the um, representative of these demonstrators um, arrested, right? So the question is, I don't know when the office of the first lady was established in the first place in Nigeria that it became so powerful that it can stop anybody in their track, including overriding the decision of uh, a sitting governor. So what is your take on that, Prof? <laughs> You're trying to draw me. You 
You know, Nigeria is a land of wonders. You know, it's, a, it's a land of many, many firsts. And uh, I am as mystified as you are. <laughs> mystified. This level of impunity is one I've commented on. And whatever it is you think of it, believe me, I share your thoughts. <laughs> questions there. Can we, can we keep the questions quite short so that we can get more in? Uh, good evening, Professor Wojcienka. I just want to uh, thank you for what you've shared with us tonight. My name is Akin Yetade. I want to ask what your experience was uh, working with Professor Akin Mishola and the translation of your Ake to Yoruba. Because many people would have loved to read many of your great works in Yoruba. But he did this work with you, and I want to see what, what was your experience of doing that, uh, linking it with what you said about working on Fagmua's work. Thank you. Um, no, I never worked with Akinshola on the translation. Uh, I know Akinshola, I know his works. You know, he's also a playwright, and he's written some poetry as well in Yoruba, and uh, my instinct uh, was to leave the work entirely to him and to intervene only if he asks me any question. And uh, it's interesting that when he was asked the question, what was it like <coughs> translating such a play uh, as Death and the King's Horseman, this critical interest, uh, literary interest, I think, and he said it was no sweat at all. He said what he did was to translate back into Yoruba a work which I had thought in Yoruba. And I think that's uh, a remarkable comment for any translator to make. He said as far as he was concerned, this was a Yoruba play. And that, so all he did was just bring it back to the language in which I thought it out. So I think that's the answer to that question. Yes. Can we Take a couple at the same time, and then perhaps we can get Professor Schoenka to answer. Good evening, sir. Um, happy birthday in advance. Um, <laughs> my name is Peter Dovan. I live and reside in UK. Um, I've got two questions, quick questions for you, sir. Um, the first one is, in today's world of technology, in today's world of Facebook, Twitter, how best do you think we can preserve the African industry? Sorry, I'm, I'm losing you. I'm losing you. Okay. Um, my question is: In today's world of technology, um, and you know the generational trend in events around us, how best do you think we can preserve the African history, which you've actually mentioned today about its richness? How best do you think we can preserve it for the coming generation and? to educate other ethnicities around the world about how rich the African culture is. And secondly, um, someone mentioned about your Afro. Um, I remember your picture in your book, Trials of Brother Jero. It hasn't changed. Um, <laughs> it's still, it's still, it was dark in the picture of um, Trials of Brother Jero, but it's a bit gray now, which is understandable. But. Uh, um, what led to this identity you've created for yourself over the years? What, what, ha what, what have you done or what, what motivated you to keep this identity over God knows how many years now? Thank you. Over the last bit. Over the last phrase? The last bit. That last, the last few words. Over. Last, over, 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 over 20 years, 30, over 50 years now. Can we have the question next to you first and then yeah. we can perhaps... Is that me? Good evening, sir. Um, my name is um, Evangelist Alex, yeah. and um, the question I want to ask is, um, obviously, you're a great writer around the world, and um, you've got a lot of readers and audiences, but I want to I wanna, I wanna know how you actually felt when you first had your first publishing deal because I'm a man that's been writing for a long time and um, I send my manuscripts out to publishers and um, 
I haven't seemed to have got anywhere, but I'm not giving up. <laughs> but 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 when I when I look at when I look at someone like you, it motivates me. So I just want to know because I know one day I'm going to get a publishing deal myself. And and sec secondly. I, I, I can't I keep these questions in my head. Can, can no. we just allow Professor to answer those? Because we have to wind up in a second. So, and secondly, the question I want to ask um, Dr. I think we, we will we'll take the questions we have already and we'll leave that one to later. Okay, please. You, you, can't, you can ask too many questions. I will forget the first ones by the, t by the time I. I, I yes, I okay, up. I think so, we should go ahead. Let me just let me deal with it. Let me deal with the ones I remember. Uh, history. How do we teach others, how do we spread the word, shall we say, the, the, the history of, and the culture, presumably, uh, African um, uh, heritage, etc. Well, all, well, first of all, history also can be transmitted through fiction, as you know, uh, using the material of history in theater, in film especially, in film. And by film, I'm not talking about that one, two, three, four, five, that nine-letter word, which I find very difficult to utter. It begins with an N, um, you know. Uh, but real serious imaginative films, which utilizes material. And through paintings, the, uh, plastic arts, uh, you can study a lot of history through the, um, the sculptures of, of any people, the paintings, and so on, through their artistic work the music, encouraging all of that. Now, how do, I, how do you preserve the character of Brother Jiro? Brother Jiro is constantly uh, evolving. Uh, Brother Jiro of the 60s is not the Jiro of today. Brother Jiro today has private jets. <laughs> Doesn't travel like the rest of you, uh, the rest of us. No, no, no. Has built universities clogs up the expressway between Ibadan and uh, something. Every Friday and every religious day, you know, reduces everything to a crawl. Um, has, runs businesses all over the place. Uh, is received like royalty in some other countries where, I mean, Brother Jero, I think, is, has an empire in London. Has an empire in London. And occasionally, Brother Jero gets jailed. You know, thank goodness. So he's become part and parcel of life. Then the uh, third question, that uh, the first one that gentleman mm. asked, what was it now? You see, that's what comes of asking too many questions yeah. at a time. <laughs> so what technology is it? and hmm? preser technology. preserving. I forgot. What, what was the first question again? I... Oh, yeah. Remind us, remind us. After this, if then we yeah. just take two more, because you speak. We said we'd finish in time. I know, I know Can what we just quickly to sum that up? Just we have yeah. one more question. That'll be yeah. Good evening, sir. Yes. Um, Professor Wale Shoyinka, the question I want to ask is, is because, like, as an evangelist, I'm a man that's um, written loads of manuscripts, and I send my work to, and okay. I send my work to um, various publishers, but. Um, I don't seem to be getting anywhere. Oh. So the question I wanted to ask you was, as, um, as the great writer that you are, with audiences around the world and readers, I wanted to know how you felt or how did you get your first publishing I deal? I remember. OK. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, second, the second question I wanted to ask. So. I think that's enough. Shall we, shall we deal with that one? Thank you. Let me. Let me deal with that one. Let me deal with that one. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Let's, let's move. Oh, yeah. First, the, the reaction, my response to holding the first published book in my hand was like uh, the taste of a wine you never encountered before. It's as rich as that. It's, it's just something marvelous in holding in your hand. No matter how, it was a slim volume, but that somebody had taken it on, 
presented it between book covers and taken the trouble to actually launch it, you know, invite people to come and share that particular moment, marvelous moment. Now, script. I said earlier, you must be prepared to collect your rejection slips. There's no other way than to, uh, to feel committed that despite setbacks, you want to continue to express that there's something inside you that you want to express. Obviously, it can be discouraging that you get your rejection slip, especially if it's followed by another. Uh, some people solve it by, uh, by self-publishing, but then you have to have some money in your pocket because they charge you uh, for it. Um, there's just no other way. If it's a play, you can gather some friends around and read the manuscript, the, read the text, and just listening to it. In fact, this applies not just to plays. It applies even to prose or poetry. And just hearing it and watching people's reaction, it can teach you quite a lot. Because writing is not a finished business ever. It's a continuing process. And just participating in something you believe in, for me, is already half fulfillment. The remaining half comes, as I said before, when you get that sip of wine, which is equivalent to a new publication in your hand. After a while, of course, you can get blasé. But that first publication, <laughs> believe you me, it's purity. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have no more time. So thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't manage to get in all the others. But Professor Shoinka has other things to do, unfortunately. <laughs> So thank you very much for you. the conversation thank and thanks thank for answering the question.